Hello, and welcome to today's webinar, Emergency Cash Flow Planning, What Hospital Leaders Can Do Now. Today's webinar will be hosted by Eric Schell, Stroudwater's Associate Chairman of the Board, and Kevin Durandi, CEO of Mahaska Health Partnership. And with that, I will hand it over to Eric and Kevin. Thank you, Ashley. We want to thank everybody for joining us during this very stressful time. Um, our goal is to make this one hour of your time worth your commitment. And so um, th that's, that's what we're going to shoot for. A little bit of an origin of this talk. Um, beginning over just over a week ago, um, I was trying to put my sh myself in the shoes of rural hospital leaders saying, how can we help? Um, what can Stroudwater do? What, what, what can we do to help those folks? And, and, and it came to me as I was getting calls from a number of CEOs and CFOs, you know, talking about how volumes were dropping 20, 30, 40% and cash was drying up. Um, I got a call a week ago, Saturday night from a good friend of mine, the CEO of a, a rural hospital in the mid Atlantic, you know, cash is drying up. I'm not sure what to do. And, um, and, and at the same time, I'm receiving a lot of information in following the CARES Act and, and, and um, you know, all there's other sources of information related to funds available. And then so, so again, about a week ago, I pulled together a, a Word document identifying all the opportunities for rural hospitals to access cash and as, 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 as part of this COVID-19 response. Uh, I, was, I sent it along to my friend, Kevin Durande, CEO of Mahaska Health, who's uh, participating in this call. And he said, Eric, this is exactly right, and we have done most of this. And, and let me tell you how it's impacted my organization. And uh, when he got done explaining, I said, Kevin, we, we, we have to get this message out to more folks. And so um, out of that conversation it became the impetus for this call today. Um, there's a number of us here on this call, and we appreciate your time. Again, a quick qualifier before we begin. Uh, there's 36 slides of content. There's lots of stuff in here, so please be patient. Some of it will apply to you. Some of it will not apply to you. But if something doesn't apply to you, the next slide could very well. So just be, be, be patient here. Um, um, also, I would say that, 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 that the original recording of this, there were some technology challenges. And, and because of that, we had to re-record some of this. And so um, the first five minutes of this is actually that re-recording. So um, you know, again, be patient with us on that. So with that as an introduction, let's, let's get going um, around immediate cash planning. There's uh, Eric and, and Kevin, so you can see our faces. Uh, the good, guy, good looking guy on the bottom, that's Kevin. Uh, the guy on the top is, 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 is myself. The agenda for today, so we're going to start off with kind of what are we hearing in the market? And, and essentially, it becomes this call to action. It becomes a call to action for us to give this presentation. It becomes a call for action to what you have to do immediately. Um, we want to share uh, Kevin's story from Mahaska Health. And, 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 and because, um, you know, when, when he originally sent me his, his, his um, email in response to my, uh, the, the, the um, Word document I sent him, I was rereading it to a colleague of mine and, and literally tears started coming out of my eyes thinking how powerful the story was. And so I thought maybe it was important for you all to hear that. And then the next section in, 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 a, in a meat of the agenda is what are the immediate steps that we should all be taking to, to, to um, enhance our cash position, preserve our cash position, et cetera. So with that as the interjection, let's just talk about the market. Um, here, here's what we're hearing. Um, I, I, I was on a call last week with some folks in the Mid-South area, uh, and the CEO said, our volumes have dried up. We had to lay off our, our ambulatory surgery staff, our, our, our nurse practitioners in our clinic, members of our administrative team were all furloughed, and, and, um, and uh, you know, tough times just to preserve cash. Um, I, I, I exchanged emails with a, a CFO from a Mid-Atlantic Critical Access Hospital uh, last Friday, saying we had to furlough 25% furlough of our staff. Uh, there was an article in our local paper. I live in Portland, Maine, so there was an article in the paper on Sunday about uh, uh, you know, you know, a regional critical access hospital here that had to reduce pay for salaried employees, including their physicians, and furlough hourly workers. And then finally, Modern Healthcare just uh, had an article on Monday uh, around a for-profit system that was furloughing 500 full-time physicians. 
Uh, so these are the stories over and over and over we're hearing. And, and, and um, um, uh, the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics reported 42,500 healthcare industry job losses in March. And, and really the COVID uh, hit really just became in the last two weeks of March. So it'll be interesting to see what happens here in April. 96% uh, of those losses were reported in the ambulatory care sector. Um, and, um, and, and, and then at the same time, we're hearing industry experts agree that providers who furlough staff risk losing them and then and ultimately must be replaced as volume ramps back up as we get through the other side of this pandemic. So then the question becomes, are there other opportunities? Kevin has a really important um, uh, story to tell. And, and again, one of the main reasons why he was involved in in this presentation. Um, I want to start with, here's what we're going to tell you. This is what we believe, and, and this is what, um, you know, uh, I, I've been spending a week uh, in, in the firm developing this, sharing it with, with many, um, having feedback from many in the industry, from critical access hospital CEOs all over that have seen a preview of this. Uh, Kevin actually saw this, and he shared some things. And so uh, this list, is what we firmly believe is what all rural health systems and frankly larger systems should be doing immediately um, to address this this reduction in short-term volume that we're seeing and it includes everywhere from preparing a 26-week weekly cash projection you know get you know receive accelerated medicare payments um, start looking into the, the the public health and social services grant fund um, and you can just see it goes on and on and on. We're going to touch on each of these um, individually. But before we do that, um, I, I would like to share with you Kevin's story from Mahaska Health, or Kevin and his team story from Mahaska Health. So, Kevin, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you, Eric. Appreciate it. So, as far as what uh, Mahaska Health, um, so we're a critical access hospital here in southeast Iowa. Um, about 412 employees um, service about a population of 22,000 in the county. So we decided uh, immediately to maintain our current staffing levels. And as a lot of you have done, uh, you reallocated a lot of your employees to different areas in the hospital. Uh, immediately, we sent uh, individuals to our cleaning uh, departments, facilities, environmental services. Uh, we've set up in-car screening areas, and of course, that in-car screening area um, has to be manned 24 hours a day. And so, thankfully, we've had people that have stepped up who have been working nights, work the night shift, and then the individuals who are working days work the day shift. Uh, so we're also collecting, uh, providing allergy shots, uh, specimen collection. And then we've also set up a phone triage system. Uh, for respiratory patients, and then we also set one up in the community just for general community questions. Uh, and then within a 24-hour period, uh, our IT team uh, propped up telehealth via Google Duo and FaceTime. Uh, we also complement that with just some simple phone calls. Uh, so that's been a great benefit to the community because some people obviously are scared to come to the hospital for whatever reason. Uh, then we also allocated employees to set up a COVID risk assessment exam, uh, essentially a wellness exam. And so that's been a great benefit to the community. We also had employees who are going through our EMR uh, to find patients with comorbidities that might have um, be susceptible uh, to what's going on. Also, uh, we have a lot of nurses and CMAs and employees who are able to, who have time with our volumes that have gone down in the clinic to just call our patients, ask how they're doing, and is there any questions that we can answer? And I know the community has really appreciated that, and that's something that um, would be helpful for your communities. Also, um, we've provided an emergency preparedness plan. Uh, so the California Hospital Association has a very good surge emergency preparedness plan. And it's about eight or nine pages, but highly recommend that plan. It was very detailed. You just make it your own. And uh, that's been something that we've been meeting with our task force and our providers on a daily basis, working through that plan. 
And then we, a couple of action items financially, immediately we applied for the Medicare Accelerated Repayment Fund, prepayment funds. Um, obviously, that's something that you have to work, work on through your cost report. Uh, keep in mind that that's, you want that reflected um, payable back to Medicare and should be reflected on your balance sheet. Um, and so there'll be a reconciliation starting after about four months. And then uh, if you do decide to hold those funds for 12 months, there will be a 10.25% of interest charged. Um, so that payment will be received within seven days and it's been working very quickly. Uh, so that's been helpful. Uh, also immediately apply for the SBA loan. Uh, that's something that we did, even though we're a county hospital. Um, we have to keep track of that $100 billion in grants. Uh, I do know that there's uh, considerations last night even about lifting the 500 employee limit uh, for these SBA loans. So go ahead and send in your application. We also evaluated the option to defer payments uh, for the Social Security payroll taxes. Um, so this requires that the deferred uh, taxes be paid over a two-year period. Um, so the amount paid by December 31, 21, and the other half by uh, December 31 of 22. So go ahead, Benson. Thank you. We also immediately applied for a FEMA grant. Uh, so our facility, uh, make sure your facility is recording all your labor costs, supplies, equipment, other costs associated with the COVID-19 effort. Make sure you record all of your management and physician meetings as well. Um, our IT team uh, utilized Office 365 Teams, which is a virtual platform, which has been very helpful. And you, you can record all your meetings through that. Also, we immediately met with our local bank. Um, so we established a $1 million line of credit. And if you need more than a million dollars, um, you can meet with a bank that you have relationship with, but then if there's two or uh, other banks in town or more, uh, you make sure your personal bank fronts the majority of the loan or the line of credit, and then the other banks will be happy to um, back the other bank if needed, if you need more than a million funds or half a million, whatever your need is, uh, make sure that you reach out to your local banks and, and hopefully they'll be able to help you immediately. We also created a COVID-19 cost center. My CFO, Gene Williamson, uh, did a great job of pulling all this together. Uh, so we're tracking our overtime costs uh, for Medi Medicare cost reports. And uh, so that so at some point we can allocate for all of that. Uh, we also wanted to continue to create customer loyalty and uh, take care of our employees. We had a lot of restaurants in town and uh, folks who wanted to provide food. And so we funneled that all through our uh, food services director to make sure that uh, there were vendors that were approved. Um, and then each day we, we round on our employees, whether it's our physicians or administrative team, making sure particularly talk to the folks on the inpatient floor, ER and the screening area to pick up uh, quick operational changes if need be. We're also one of the things financially is, uh, you know, hopefully we get back to some type of normalcy uh, in, at some point. And so start having those conversations now to ramp up your clinics and elective surgeries. Uh, so our surgeons came to us and we met with them about, hey, how can we possibly have Saturday morning surgeries or Saturday surgeries? And then also have uh, our primary care clinics be open until 8 or 9 p.m. A lot of people are gonna be trying to get back to work. And so we wanna make sure that uh, we all accommodate uh, those needs so they don't have, to, not so many people have to leave work again, but we wanna make sure that we accommodate their needs. Uh, so make sure you start having those discussions with your providers. Uh, we're also holding daily virtual task force meetings uh, with our leaders and providers. And uh, we've put together a staffing matrix in case we do see a surge in uh, bed capacity and, and COVID patients. Uh, we've also engaged uh, one of our local churches. Uh, they have 52,000 square feet of space, and that might be a non-COVID clinic that is needed. Um, and then we also engaged our local hotel. Uh, if we do, if we if we get surges in different areas, we want to make sure that uh, our employees have an option 
to be able to self quarantine away from their family if needed and we'll provide that housing. We're also uh, worked with our marketing team. So we're posting YouTube and Facebook videos uh, with our physician leaders uh, to deliver updates and reassure the community. And then also we've been working diligently with local businesses uh, to just think of ways that, you know, how can we take care of patients in a different manner while we're waiting on ventilators and that type of thing. And so we worked with Musco Lighting, who's here in Oskaloosa, engineer a portable intubation box um, that helps minimize droplets uh, and aerosolization of saliva, which is really a neat deal that uh, our local community came up with. But all in line, I want to thank Eric and his team because uh, they've got great resources. Tap into them. Um, so appreciative of what they've done. And uh, also, we want to thank our frontline caregivers for what everybody's doing. So appreciate all of your efforts. I know there's a lot going on. So thank you. Kevin, thank you. Quick question for you. So those are all the things that you've done at Mahaska Health um, to impact your community. What's been the reaction within the hospital, outside the hospital? What, what's, what's the feel like? Well, the key is, Eric, as you know, is uh, if you have a great team and that team communicates, a lot of great things happen. And so having providers meeting on a daily basis, getting the message out to your own employees, making sure that you round, and then getting that information out to the public it's amazing how everybody just comes together to, to fight this and work together. Fantastic. Well, thanks, thanks for your comments. Uh, I'm sure there'll be lots of questions for you, and not for me. Uh, so, so we're going to get back to our, 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 our um, uh, kind of going through the list of, of, you know, kind of things that we proactively can be doing today to be, put yourself in a position like Kevin has done, Kevin and, and the, the team at Mahaska Health, uh, what they've been able to do, and 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 here's the short list right here, and the 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 rest of the slides are really uh, just um, you know more information on each of these programs and how we should advance them. But um, yeah, so 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 the the, the 26 week uh, weekly cash flow projection is going to enable better short term, medium term decision making, and um, and and we think it should really go on out to the 26 weeks. And if it's an Excel spreadsheet, we could even extend it out past there if we need to. But it, it, there's a number of variables that are gonna impact this. One is your beginning cash balances. The second is reduced volume. And the impact that reduced volume, you know, the timing of when that, that volume is gonna be impacting your cash position. Um, we've heard all over the increased expenses related to personal protective equipment and investments. That, that are we're incurring right now, um, labor costs. I mean, if we're if we're taking out labor, then 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 you know, we have to factor that in. Um, the big piece, and, and I'll show you an example of, of one here in a minute, is the um, is is the um, cash related to the CARES Act and 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 some some cash provisions associated with that. Potential increased bad debt and the ability to collect on that, and then other balance sheets, for example, paying off long-term debt. All of these uh, should be factored in to your 26-week cash projection. Uh, here's an example of, of a, um, um, you know, uh, uh, an example of a, a, a prototype critical access hospital, about $30 million in net revenue, beginning with a cash balance of $2.5 million. Um, this is weekly, beginning on April, the week of April 5th, continuing out through September 27th, the week of September 27th. And, and we start with a beginning cash balance of $2.5 million. And the red line you see depicted on this, this graph or chart is, is it's your unrestricted cash balance without any of the cash inflows from the CARES Act. The blue line happens to be the cash, um, your, your, your unrestricted cash balances beginning at that $2.5 million but affected by many of the programs that are available. For the modeling purposes here, we assume that the critical access hospital would tap into the Medicare um, accelerated slash advanced payment program in which they're able to receive um, um, uh, uh, six months worth of, of, of uh, claims, Medicare claims, 
from the peer, uh, excuse me, 125% of, 100 of the, the, the payment amounts. Um, going back for the six month period, um, um, uh, July 1st, 2019 through December 31st, 2019. Um, we assumed that the, the hospital was gonna be able to tap into the Small Business Association Payroll Protection Program loan, and then also some, some, some dollars was shipped. We also assumed a 50% decline in patient volume. And, um, um, and, and, and beginning on 315 um, and continuing through the projection period, we assumed expenses remain constant. And then, um, and, and what you'll see here is that after 26 weeks with these assumptions, the cash, cash balance for this uh, critical access hospital prototype was $4.2 million greater than, than, than where they began at 2.5 million. In other words, the impact of the CARES Act and some of the programs that are eligible have a significant improvement on cash, um, um, such that, that, that we believe it's really important just to start running numbers like this so that we can you know, have a better understanding and have much better decision making. So with that as a cash projection, I um, mean, that's something that really is outside of the CARES Act, but we believe it's something important and so that you can be more comfortable knowing that 26 weeks out or 39 weeks out or ever far you decide that we want to we wanna, um, prepare this document, that, that you feel comfortable with your cash position. And then and, and create a model so that you can vary different changes in, 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 um, in volumes. You know, at some point, volumes will come back. And as Kevin said, they, there's going to be much, many services that have been deferred and that we're going to want to get put back in as soon as the, the, the pandemic dies down, as, as hopefully it will soon. So Kevin mentioned the fact that they tapped into some accelerated advanced payments. These are the Medicare payments. Um, we think that, 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 that uh, hospitals ought to immediately ap apply for these. Um, and, and it's it's a pretty straightforward process where you can go onto your Mac, your your Medicare um, audit contractor website, and and there's a pretty sim simple form to fill out, and it's based really on PSNR information. It's already been pre-established. Um, um, uh, for non-critical access hospitals, they can get uh, advanced payment, you know, and generally the payment is within seven days. Um, within, within, um, they'll get the payment within seven days, representing three months worth of, of, of historical payment. Critical access hospitals are able to get 100 or request 125% of Medicare payment for a six month period ending uh, December 31st, uh, 2019. Again, timing within seven calendar days um, and, and the request submitted to, to the Medicare audit contractors using forms on their website. So pretty straightforward. Um, there is these are required to be repaid um, for all providers. The repayment begins 120 days past receipt. And again, this is something you should model into your 26-week forecast, cash forecast. That out 13 weeks, essentially what Medicare is going to be doing is zeroing out their 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 claims. Um, and when they adjudicate, they'll zero out the payment amount to the hospitals um, and until that loan is repaid or that advance is repaid, excuse me. Um, uh, for, for the, the, there's the, the, the loan, these advances are interest-free. Critical access hospitals have a year plus the 30-day notification period in which they're notified if there's amounts still outstanding. Um, and, and, and non-critical access hospitals, they have a six-month period and of, of to, to, to repay the advance plus the 30-day notification. After that, interest is, is pretty steep at 10.25%. So we really want to make sure that we do all we can to get those, um, those advances paid for. So that's step, uh, that's step two. The, the Public Health and Social Services Emergency Grant Fund, another acronym in healthcare, PFSSEF. Uh, this is the the hundred billion dollars uh, a program that that the um, the, the appropriations committee uh, uh, in Senate drafted the language and and it's vague at this point. Ultimately, it's saying there's a hundred billion dollars set aside for um, um, health systems um, to be used for certain things um, with guidance yet to come on this. And so you got a hundred billion dollars to sit up still waiting out. From for some more specific guidance, how to tap into that. 
Um, last week there was an article um, in, in one of the, the, the healthcare literature that the American Hospital Association was requesting 25,000 for hospital bed as a means of distributing 23 billion. Um, um, the one point that I think is important to note here is that, that the, origin, the initial uh, you know, overview of the program said that, that, that HHS, uh, Health and Human Services, is gonna review applications and make payments on a rolling basis to address immediate cash needs. The way I read that is it, it, a rolling cash basis, in my opinion, means that it's not going to be, you know, it's not a, it's not a competitive process. It's not going to be everyone has to get their grants in by June 30th. It's, it, it's a, you know, for us accountants, it's a FIFO. First in, first out would be my interpretation of this. And so, what, um, what, what, what? Well, so, so, so some of the qualifying expenses in this article that I read that was just general information. Um, allowable expenses include the non-reimbursable expenses. So if it's being paid for in some, some other bucket, it won't be reimbursable under this $100 billion piece. Um, but it includes building, retrofitting new ICUs, uh, increased staffing or training, um, PPE, uh, temporary structures. And then just recently, uh, it was announced, I believe it was on Friday, that Secretary Azar came out and said that um, bad debt expense or the cost related to bad debt for COVID-19 patients would be dollars that taken from this hundred billion dollars. Um, so with a secretary to establish reconciliation process. So uh, you know, my recommendation here would be to start um, identifying these qualifying expenses that may fit within this so that when, when, the, when the guidance comes out, we're, we're, we're at the front end of this first in first out process. The next is the Small Hospital Improvement Program. Not many of you won't be eligible for this, but um, this is, a, many of us know this is the SHIP program. Um, um, I was on a call yesterday with the rural hospitals in Massachusetts. All of them qualify for this program. Um, and, and historically it's been, boy, it used to be around $7,000 a year. Then it been, the numbers kicked up over the last several years to uh, $10,000 or $12,000 a year. Um, the, the, under the CARES Act, there was $180, $180 million granted through the CARES Act to go towards this SHIP, um, um, this SHIP grant, and, and essentially about $90,000 per hospital. Um, on my call yesterday, the State Office of Rural Health folks uh, suggested that, that those applications are being, um, the, the, from, from the states are being submitted and the grant dollars are being distributed. And the, Hospitals could be seeing these money, these these these, these grant funds, um, relatively quickly. So, you know, our I think Kevin, you may you may want to comment on this, but I think you already submitted your your grant application for this ninety thousand. We did, we did, Eric. And what were some of the expenses that you had in there? You know, as far as expenses go, um, gosh, there's a little bit of everything, but uh, Gene Williamson submitted all that and uh, we're excited, we confirmed that we're gonna receive it. Awesome. Yeah, and, and it's supposed to be relatively time. Now it's, it's, it's $90,000, so it's, it's, a, it's a single, but still, I mean, it's, it's $90,000 that you didn't have. So, so that's uh, step number two, immediately file application for $90,000 uh, SHIP, SHIP grant. The next is, and we hear lots of talk about this. Um, frankly, my company just um, 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 submitted this um, um, uh, uh, an application on Sunday. Um, interestingly enough, this is so, so any any um, small um, small health system with less than 500 employees should be submitting this loan application um, immediately, and. Um, um, it's a first come, it's there's 349 billion um, in, in this program and it's on a first come first serve basis. Um, we, we really felt from, from my company's perspective that we, we had to get it in this weekend um, because um, um, you know, it, 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 that $349 billion is, is not going to stick around long. So it's, um, uh, so this, the SBA, Small Business Association, under the um, Payroll Protection Program, they guarantee 100% of, of, um, of, of, of loans for which a majority, if not all of those loans could be forgiven. Um, and so, so eligibility for this is that small businesses operating on, on 
February 15th with fewer than 500 employees. And that includes full-time, part-time, and any other staff. So you got to count, it's, it's a head count. Um, and otherwise meets the SBA standard size. Um, the, um, so, so the original interim final rule for this, this uh, payroll protection program came out Thursday night around midnight. On Friday night, a second interim final rule came out that defined the, the, the affiliate for purposes of aggregating lines. Um, for example, many larger, uh, many um, rural health systems that when you add up all the affiliates are greater than 500 employees will not be eligible for this program. And um, um, uh, so, so, I mean, that's a uh, Again, if you if you if you want to Google that or just reach out to me, I can send you the interim final rule. But it's uh, um, it's it, it, it's available and it was issued last Friday, uh, I believe Friday afternoon, Friday night. Uh, the one thing I want to point out, and and we 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 heard a lot of um, discussion, especially last week, around the fact that public entities would not be eligible for this. Well, in the specific criteria for eligibility, uh, the the interim final rule explicitly says um, an eligible entity is a tax exempt nonprofit 501c3 with fewer than 500 employees or any other business. Um, and, and so there's been some interpretation that public entities are not eligible. And um, I would suggest that the phrase or any other business is our opportunity to make that happen. I know National Rural Health Association, any of, the, any of you are on the NRHA listservs for the grassroots organization. Uh, Maggie Alwani is 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 fighting hard to get this in place, and so let's let's uh, let's hope that our our, our public um, our, our publicly owned uh, 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 rural health systems will become eligible for this program. So the loan amount is 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 two and a half, two and a half times, and an organization's average monthly payroll costs going back 12 months. Um, so when we, when I was just looking at our numbers on Sunday morning, it, you go back all the way 12 months, you look at your average payroll costs, including uh, actually compensation wages, um, 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 uh, benefits, um, state local taxes assessed on, on, uh, on the compensation, but we have to back off any amounts for salaries prorated greater than $100,000. And so um, once we figure out that average monthly amount, the the, the the um, the loan is 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 2.5 times that amount, and um, um, so so great. So now so we get the loan, and and supposedly the timing of it is 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 fairly in the in the very near term. Karen, Kevin, I'd, I'd like to hear your thoughts on that. But then the forgiveness, the the, the amount that becomes forgiven, is um, it's, it's 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 your payroll costs. Uh, Let's see how is it? It's 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 kind of a goofy calculation. It's eight weeks worth of of um, of payroll costs. Um, yeah, for, for for payroll beginning on the date of the origination, and then there's another and then there's another twenty five percent that can be amounts including mm -hmm. utilities, leasing, mortgage obligations, etc. And so that amount then becomes forgive um, forgiven. Um, wages can't be reduced by more than 25%. Um, let me just see what I want to touch on here. Um, so interest rate, if, if, if there's a repayment period um, of, of, of two years, the loan can be deferred for six months. Uh, there's no prepayment penalties. Um, there's no borrowing and lender fees. And the interest rate, if we do have to extend it out for two years, is at 1%. Kevin, can you comment? Did you guys tap into this? We did. We went ahead and submitted it, and uh, so our my CFO Gene Williamson uh, did the payroll calculation on that, and we sent it in. Excellent. Is there an expectation of time? Is there is there some certain timing when we expect to receive some of that back? You know, we we didn't receive any timing on that. Uh, we're work, we worked with our local banker, and he submitted it uh, this weekend. Okay. Well, um, so, so the next opportunity, and, and this is really for those organizations um, that, that are not uh, um, eligible for the, um, um, the SBA small business, uh, or the, the um, excuse me, the payroll protection program. Uh, 
the CARES Act uh, under Section 2301 and 2302 provided some opportunity for, for um, um, payroll tax credits um, as well as payroll tax deferrals. And so I've added some language here. This is, this is something I, geez, I just added uh, two hours ago. I was talking to a friend of mine who's the CEO of the health system in Pennsylvania. And uh, he shared with me the importance of this because what he said was that we're not eligible for the um, SBA payroll protection program. Uh, they were too large when they aggregated their, their, their hospitals. And, and so um, you know, this became a much important, uh, important piece of his cash planning strategy was this refundable tax credit. The second piece of this is the section 2302, which is your tax deferral, where, where we can defer the social, the employer portion of the social security taxes. You know, it's the 6.2% that your employer um, um, contributes um, and any amounts paid between um, March 27th and, and uh, 1231, um, we can defer payment uh, with 50% repaid on 1231-2021 and 50% repaid on 2022. Um, and there's no penalties or interest if deposited on those stated dates. So again, uh, definitely not as interesting as the payroll protection program, but there is something in there for those that don't qualify for that program. Kevin, I'm not gonna ask you to comment on it because you are not eligible to participate in this, be being that you tapped into the, the better program. Uh, the next program that, that we think that, that we should immediately file um, 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 your, your um, uh, this request um, is the, the FEMA, um, the Public Assistance Program. And, and so, and this is one I, I just became, I became more, more aware of over the last uh, three days. But, um, you know, so our recommendation is to, to immediately file Federal Emergency Management Agency Request for Public Assistance document. Um, and begin tracking and begin tracking costs for the duration of the response. So, what are these FEMA grants? Um, they, um, if the, the FEMA provides grants through the Public Assistance Program to cover costs of, and in quote, emergency protective measures that are taken to save lives, protect public health and safety, and to protect um, improve uh, uh, to protect improved property. Um, so it does require a president's emergency declaration, which occurred and it, it rolled out. So the first, the first declarations were, were um, kind of mid-March. Um, and then, you know, kind of more of the la latter um, emergency declarations were just, um, gosh, um, Sunday. Um, you know, I think North, North Dakota or another state, um, there's a couple states were just declared as of this weekend. And, um, and, and with that declaration, um, that, that the uh, FEMA has allocated dollars to grant recipients, and the grant recipients are generally states, uh, territories, or tribal governments. And then what happens is then there's the applicant or subrecipient becomes organizations like you, public hospitals, private nonprofit hospitals. Um, uh, um, and, and what's interesting is that, that, that for profits, they cannot directly submit as an applicant or subrecipient, although there is some language in the rules that say they can contract with a government agency to carry out some of these emergency protective measures, that there's, some, there's an opportunity there. The key here is to make sure you document, document, document. Yeah, that's, that's exactly right. And, and, and what Kevin's talking about documenting is the reimbursement under this, this grant that when you file this, um, this, this document, and, and the documents on the um, um, uh, your, your state FEMA organization um, 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 a website, but it covers 75% of costs of emergency protective measures, and they call those category B, and 100% of management costs. But it's just the management costs related to managing this FEMA program. And those costs can't, they, they cannot otherwise be reimbursed. So some of the costs that, that, that they, they listed as an opportunity is triage and medically necessary tests related to COVID-19 cases, emergency medical treatment of COVID-19 patients, prescription costs related to COVID-19 patients, purchases of PPP, or gosh, PP, personal protective equipment, DME and consumable medical supplies, again, specific to COVID patients, any medical waste related to COVID patients, 
and emergency medical transport related to, to, to patients. Some of the excluded costs are long-term medical treatments. If a COVID patient gets admitted to the, uh, to, 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 as an inpatient, those costs are no longer reimbursable um, through the FEMA program, again, because it's, they're being reimbursed otherwise. And then costs that extend past the emergency period will not be covered either. Um, uh, administrative costs associated with the, uh, uh, the, the treatment of COVID-19 patients, they're not eligible, but what are, what are eligible costs are the management costs incurred administering the, 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 um, the, the, this, the, this award. And they have to be limited to like 3% of the award, so it's a minor amount. Um, so, so some of the costs, um, labor overtime, um, but only for budgeted staff, and then unbudgeted staff that we had to add. Equipment, lease equipment, imperial contract services um, are all um, included in the cost eligibility. And, and Kevin, you said you filed for this? We did, yes. And, and, are you, and how are you tracking? So we have spreadsheets that we've put together. Uh, we utilize our Chrono system as well. Uh, and then also we're tracking all of our meetings through Office 365 Teams. And this is so you can specifically quantify those amounts that we could submit under this under this FEMA uh, grant, grant request. Correct. And then we created a separate cost center as well. Excellent. Um, you know, now, now this is something that all critical access hospitals have, but I want to put it out there. It's not specific to the, the, the CARES Act. Um, but it is specific to an organization that gets paid um, reimbursed on costs where volume drops by 50%. And so the recommendation here is file updated Medicare rates with Medicare Advantage plans to ensure appropriate re um, revenue. I, I think the bullet before this would actually say, um, you know, prepare interim cost reports. Um, and, and as we prepare those interim cost reports, um, we're going to get a better idea of what our rates are going to be. And when we get those rates, we're going to get those submitted. Um, and, and so uh, you know, the, the issue here is when volume drops by 50%, our, our, especially our rural, our small rural hospitals, generally between 80 and 90% of our costs are fixed or step fixed. So as volume drops, our unit costs skyrocket. Um, Medicare will pay those costs of the, their portion of those skyrocketed costs um, as long as they, you know, kind of, and, and on a real time basis, as long as we get our interim cost reports prepared, prepare spreadsheets, estimate what the costs are going to be. Um, and then as we get those rates, let's get those submitted to the Medicare Advantage plan because they don't settle at the end of the year. So that's a really important opportunity. Kevin, I don't know if you have, have you looked at it at the filing an interim cost report yet? We're, I know that Gene's looking into that right now and that's something that's on our radar for sure. Yeah, okay. Um, and uh, the next area is around contacting uh, third party payers for relief. Um, you know, uh, one of our consultants here, she provided me about three or four slides related to how to, to deal with third party payers. She came out of that environment. And, and, um, um, and, 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 and the first thing that she said is request an extension of the timely filing and appeal deadline. So uh, what, she, what she wanted me to share was that, that we have to recognize that they're dealing with the same stuff that we're dealing with, the insurers are. They've got people working from home, often lower productivity that are, are, are dealing with um, you know, challenges of, of, of the disease and kids running around and those kind of things. And, and so um, by, by asking for an extension of timely filing and deadlines, it takes the pressure off on both you and, and the insurance company. Um, and, and then it gives us more time to accurately reflect our, our claims um, um, based on all the guidance that keeps coming out. Request PIP payments, um, if possible. Um, the periodic interim payments, that's PIP stand for periodic interim payments. Um, you know, can we ask for a monthly cash advance if, if our organization falls behind in claim submission? Um, and, and, and kind of work with your, your third party payer on that. Um, possible waivers of coinsurance for chronic disease medications. Um, and then possible funding of the social determinants of health assistance to members, patients. And, um, and, and obviously that's, that's uh, the, that whole initiative, the value-based payment world, has kind of taken a, 
the second stance now to, to, to the pandemic and, and all that it's put in front of us right now. But, but we see this as, as, as something that, that, you know, reaching out to these third party payers and, and doing some of these steps is, is something that we consider pretty important. Um, and then, and I think, that, and I actually use Kevin's language on here is, um, you know, work with your bank to open up or expand your line of credit. Uh, Kevin used the language of backup to the backup plan. And I think that's very appropriate here um, that, that we, that we, um, uh, to make sure that, that when all else fails, we have a backup that through an expanded line of credit. Um, and so, so yeah, I guess the, the last slide is, is just within the CARES Act, there are a number of other uh, opportunities that you'll definitely want to consider as part of your, your cash forecasting tool. Um, you know, 100% of, 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 of payment for inpatients, you know, the 120% add-on for patients admitted with COVID-19, um, the telehealth services. Please don't ask me about the details of billing for telehealth because that's um, we have people in, 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 our, in, in my firm that are the experts at that, and that's not me. Um, the uh, discontinuation of the sequestration, um, that was lifted um, for, the, for the next several months. And then the, the Medicaid, uh, the Medicaid um, uh, dish uh, cuts that were set to take place here in April that were deferred now until November, I think May, and then they were deferred until November. All of these are opportunities for us to, to have additional dollars. Um, yeah, yeah, the, the, I guess the conclusion, and I'd love to have Kevin um, voice in, is that we're, we're living in this world of unprecedented uncertainty um, for, for our rural health systems. And, and just based on, on the calls I've been getting on Saturday nights and the texts I've been getting, um, um, you know, just the frustration and, 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 and where do we go? And, um, 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 you know what? What we have, what I would like to think we could do is 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 so much is out of our, our our circle of influence at this point, and and going back to Stephen Covey and these circles of influence, whatever we can do to 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 bring things into our circle of influence, and and I think there are some things, and I think this document hopefully identifies a number of things that we can be doing. To, to shore up our, 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 our cash position so that, and, and better understand what our cash position is gonna be so that, so that we can, um, um, keep getting all these texts, it's confusing the heck out of me, uh, that, uh, that, that uh, um, to shore up our cash position so we can make better decisions on our management that'll put us in place for the immediate term. And then frankly, as, as, as we, at, at some point as we come out of this, we want to make sure that the decisions that we've been making through this process are setting us up for to be a successful organization coming out. Now is the time to be proactive. And, um, and, and ultimately, from, from somebody here not on the front lines, wishing I could do more to help, I want to thank all of you for being out on those front lines. There have been a steady stream of questions coming in, and I want to remind people that uh, if we aren't able to if we run out of time here and aren't able to answer your question, we will get back and get an answer to you in a private email. But the first question was, my hospital is a small rural hospital and we're considered dual status. Our health authority is 501c3 and we're considered a government entity. I'm told that we are eligible for the SBA PPP program because we are a 501c3. Any insight? Should we apply? Kevin, I think you answered this one uh, right on, didn't you? Go ahead. Yes, my recommendation is to go ahead and apply. I, I, and I, going back to the comment that I made, that there's that last provision in the eligibility criteria for the, the payroll protection program that says, comma, or any other organization. And um, based on um, Maggie Alani's, uh, Alani's from NRHA's email back last week, where she she thought that this, that, that, that all along there was an intention of, of having public entities, but they were just seeking out clarification on it. So, um, you know, again, to our best of the information, and as Kevin said, let's get it in and um, and and, uh, and then beg for forgiveness if we're incorrect. Okay, it was also a uh, question. The thought of 90 days cash using accelerated Medicare payments. We are requesting six months of normal payments 
which we would have to pay back if we have dropped significant volumes? Aren't we mortgaging the future with no new monies coming from this? So, so you know, going back to the um, that, that cash forecasting, that 26 week cash forecasting tool, um, having that money in advance is, is, is protection. Now, if you're a critical access hospital, because you are, because you're applying for the six months, um, what's interesting is, especially for Medicare, as your, as your volume dropped on, um, you can submit interim, higher interim rates. You're going to receive that money in the form of higher rates um, so that it won't be, you know, yeah, you are mortgaging your future, but at the same time, you're going to be getting it back. Um, my recommendation is to run the numbers and watch the impact. Again, that graph that I showed showed a significant impact from the hospital picking up dollars related to the accelerated payment. So Kevin, do you have any comments on that? I completely agree with you, Eric. Uh, the key is, is you want to be able to keep full staffing, uh, take care of your greatest asset, which is your people. And uh, so you just have to run the numbers, like Eric said, to make sure that uh, you keep your board involved in that process as well. And then uh, you move forward as best see you see fit for your community. Yeah, another question for you, Kevin, you'd indicated that uh, you applied for an SBA loan even though governmental. And the question is, were they approved for the loan? I'd like to hear some details about how the process went. Uh, the process went very smooth with our banker. Uh, obviously, all banks are extremely busy right now trying to process all of those loans, obviously. Uh, so the key is just getting on the horn, whether it's weekend or evenings, and making sure that you get your application submitted but continue to watch legislation. Uh, things are changing daily, in even in the evenings, and so they're even talking about they might lift the 500 employee limit. So we just got to keep watching it as it progresses. Okay. And I no. think I, I think um, the, the, you know, to, to, to echo Kevin is, is the application um, period just began on Friday, and um, uh, yes. And so. Uh, we, I, I think Kevin, you submit. I think Gene texted me late Friday night to say that you guys had submitted on Friday. We were a little late to the gun because we got the wrong form sent to us by our banker, and so we had to resubmit on Sunday. But we're just, uh, you know, over the next couple of weeks, you're going to find out, you know, who got the money and who did not. If, if again, the recommendation: there's 349 billion dollars in this program, and it's a first come, first get. So get your loan in, get, get your application in. Presumably, we can't get the same cost paid three times, FEMA, SBA, PPP, and the $100 billion emergency fund. How do we decide which is best in terms of actual funding and the cost report impact of these funds? <laughs> the good news with the programs is there's going to be a reconciliation for each one of them. Um, uh, so, you know, all, you're absolutely right. We're only going to get paid once for this. This, this is not a profit-making venture. Um, this is a this is holding um, holding our own venture, and so um, you know let's recognize the fact that with each of these programs we're only going to be paid um, once. Now now I will say that that for for example uh, the the um, um, FEMA program only Medicare will only pay their portion of costs, and so you still have significant other costs that will be paid by or not paid by other payers or not even reimbursable at all. And, and so we have to recognize that, that, that Medicare through the cost report pays its portion uh, where others, um, if it's not a reimbursable expense, you're not gonna get that paid for unless it's through FEMA or through um, the, um, uh, the $100 billion program. But again, that $100 billion program, who knows? You know, we, we just don't know what that's gonna look like. Hopefully we'll get guidance this week on it. And this is another organization that's also committed to retaining its staff. And the question is, have you considered any rate reductions? And if so, what did you do? And I, Kevin, I think that's probably directed to you. Did we lose Kevin again? Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, repeat that again, sorry. Sorry, said uh, another organization is also committed to retaining all staff. And the question is, have you considered any rate reductions? And if so, what did you do? Uh, we we haven't, you know, we we wanted to continue to provide full paychecks for all of our employees. Uh, we put a stake in the ground 
and thought this is a great opportunity to show our people that we're going to invest in them and take care of them during a, a major crisis. And so our people have appreciated that. We've been open with that. And uh, so we, we can't thank them enough. Thank you. And then probably in the last 60 seconds we have here, I want to be respectful of everyone else's time. Is there a cash projection, cash flow projection tool that can be shared? Anything you'd recommend, either Eric or Kevin? We reach out. I mean, I mean, everyone's going to have their own. I mean, I had my colleague mock up one. It gets pretty sophisticated in a hurry, so just shoot me an email. Shoot us an email, and and, and uh, yeah, and, and I'll talk you through. I'll talk you through it. Okay, and. In that vein, uh, as I said, we want to be respectful of people's time. There were many, many questions that we did not get to. I want to promise that we will get an email back to everyone to try to answer those questions. And thank you very much for your time and sorry for the technical issues. And again, yeah. thanks for all you guys did. Thank you, everybody. Well, that was an unusually large.
So 